Luigi's Mansion is a weird game released at a weird time for a weird lunchbox that also plays games. Outside of other games in its series, I've never played anything quite like it. Combat where you vacuum up ghosts as a Nintendo character in a horror setting is simply strange. And this wasn't just some shot in the dark spin-off. This was Nintendo's flagship title for their new console, released alongside only two other games, Super Monkey Ball and Wave Race Blue Storm in Japan. Nintendo could have gone with anything. They could have made a game in the vein of their most popular titles. Mario, Zelda, Volleyball. Instead, they took a risk, creating one of their strangest titles to date. Aside from the obvious use of Luigi, Toads, and Boos, very little about the game seems Nintendo. Even the way their logo is introduced. Nintendo. That doesn't sound very Nintendo. Beyond that, the dark color palette and atmosphere, the creepy subdued music, the one-note setting, none of it represents what defined Nintendo's most successful previous outings. And yet it managed to be one of the GameCube's best-selling games. It's rocking an 8.6 on Metacritic for user reviews. To put that into perspective, Super Mario Sunshine has an 8.62. So everyone get your vacuums ready, because there's no better place to start GameCube month than here, with Luigi's Mansion. No one can deny that Luigi's Mansion showed off the power of Nintendo's new console. There are plenty of reasons for this on a technical level. For example, in this interview with Nintendo Power, some of the creators of the game discuss how they could attach real-time shadows to all the objects in the mansion. They also mention the crisper shadows the GameCube let them get in the first place. Additionally, one of their programmers spent six months getting the dust and the way it interacts with the vacuum just right. Now, all this might sound superfluous. Sure, it's nice, but isn't gameplay what matters most? However, this attention to detail and artistic direction can't be removed from gameplay. The way the objects spin and move when Luigi uses the vacuum on them, the dust rising and falling, the way light and shadows give the rooms depth, all of it contributes to a fully realized tone. I don't think I've seen a better example of the haunted house setting since Luigi's Mansion, and that's in no small part due to how far the designers push the GameCube's graphical capabilities. The push and pull of the unique combat adds to this too. Unless you're a speedrunning monster, combat is a unique sort of struggle. That's not to say that it's difficult, because it isn't. That's just to say that the player doesn't feel completely in control, as the ghosts tug Luigi around in an attempt to break free. Luigi's place in this mansion is clear. He can affect things, but they will struggle, fight, and he will not be 100% in control of what he's doing and when he does it. From ghosts popping out behind him, to Boo's moving from room to room, to solving puzzles that are necessary to wake up ghosts, all of it puts the mansion at the forefront of the adventure. And let's not forget the music. The low, creeping strings or the somewhat more bombastic instrumentation when Luigi gets into fights or boss battles. All of it has this distinctly horror flavor, an almost slippery texturing and timber to its synthy instrumentation. There's a sense of space and emptiness to most of the music. It's carefully crafted to feel haunted, almost breathless. Yet there's also a certain levity to it, like a joke or a prank. Like so many other parts of the game, it exudes character. The sound design overall is the same way. From the tip-tap of Luigi's feet on the floor, to Luigi's slight shuddering, to the pop of ghosts getting sucked into the vacuum. There's such a clear attention to detail and charm to it. And then there's Luigi's humming. First off, having him hum is brilliant because it does more to connect Luigi with the mansion and to communicate his character. Even at the best of times, he sounds pretty spooked. But as his health depletes, his humming grows more pathetic and desperate sounding, like he can barely get the humming out. Then there's the fact that, when an area is cleared, Luigi will whistle alone. With the ghosts, the creeping music fades too, weaving the mansion, its music, and the ghosts together seamlessly into one complete audio-visual entity. Luigi's humming isn't the only great thing about him. Everything about Luigi shines here, elevating him from green Mario to his own unique self. Just listen to the way he says, Mario! 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 On top of that, there's his slight commentary about the objects strewn around the mansion. While I didn't find any of this particularly interesting, it was still a nice humorous touch that provided a further sense of interaction with the world. His expressions are wild too. Really, the time they took to craft Luigi's model paid off in spades. It's hard not to love him, the way he struts around too. He's a fabulous boy. All in all, Luigi's Mansion stands as one of Nintendo's most atmospheric adventures. In fact, it may be their most atmospheric. The game is short, but that's only because it chooses one aesthetic, one feel, and sticks with it for the entirety of the game. And I can't hold that against it, not in the slightest. All that's necessary is for players to want to return to this world, and length ceases to matter. And this world is so full of artistry, charm, and oddly enough life that, from time to time, I find myself wanting to pick up a controller and return, to be enveloped in Luigi's Mansion's unique atmosphere once again.
But then there's a question that arises. What does the game do with this atmosphere the creators have so expertly realized? Well, unfortunately, I don't think they do nearly as much as they could have. Even at a short length, the gameplay is too repetitious in one note. On top of that, beyond the aesthetics and atmosphere, few incentives are left to encourage players to replay the game in full. Let's start with the game's main ghosts, the portrait ghosts. Each of these have a unique personality and look to them, and the player needs to figure out some sort of puzzles that will make it possible to capture them. Unfortunately, these ghosts never come anywhere close to their full potential. Let's run through them. First, there's Neville Thornberry. He's a lounging dad guy reading a book in his study. You need to shine your flashlight on him when he yawns and he's yours for the taking. Until I looked it up, I honestly didn't even realize why the flashlight had worked on him. I thought it had happened to work, but whatever, he's the first portrait ghost. Simple and easy is fine. We're just getting introduced to the game's mechanics. Second, Lydia, a mother who's doing her hair in the mirror. In order to capture her, you need to move the curtain and let a draft into the room. Third, Chauncey, 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 uh, I don't know how to say that, the baby, it's the baby. If you rock the horsey in the corner, the baby gets up to play. From there, Luigi must pick up a ball and shoot it at the baby. Now he gets pissed, and you get a boss fight. Basically just your average evening babysitting. These are all the ghosts in the game's first area. There's one thing I like about them. They're a family. These ghosts have some connection to one another, and it adds to the feeling that this mansion is lived in, that the rooms have functions and purposes, and that the ghosts who reside in them have, or at least had, lives. Unfortunately, beyond their titles of dad, mom, and spoiled baby, they don't have much in the way of personality. This pattern will continue, with the vast majority of ghosts existing as a simple archetype, but still having some sort of relationship to one another, or to the mansion itself, that makes the mansion feel lived in. Of course, the fact they exist mostly as archetypes isn't a massive issue. It's not as though the ghosts need to have complex personalities and motivations. But since the game's so short and these encounters are lacking in terms of a puzzle element, it would have been nice if their personalities were a bit more compelling. So, from now on, I'm not going to mention when a ghost has a one-note or somewhat bland personality because repeating it each time makes it sound like some huge deal, when it's really not. The bigger deal is that the puzzles are way too repetitious. In order to properly convey this point, I've organized each portrait ghost encounter into one of four categories. Pose, elemental, environmental, or combat. Some ghosts will appear in multiple categories. First, pose. To capture ghosts in this category, the player needs to wait for them to strike a certain pose. There are only two ghosts like this, and in both cases, I didn't even know I needed to wait for a cue. I just happened to shine my light on them at the right time and it worked. Second, we've got elemental. With these, the player needs to grab some sort of elemental spirit and use it to make the ghosts expose themselves. I have five ghosts in this category. The problem with these encounters is simple. In all cases, the relationship between the element and the object you need to interact with is so obvious that the player isn't even likely to think of this as a puzzle to solve. Instead, the player will likely stumble on the solution just by using the element. For example, when I see a candle floating in the air, I'm gonna light it up. And when I see a little girl sleeping in bed, I'm going to splash some water on her. Especially since there was a water spirit in the previous room. Similarly, when I found Miss Petunia bathing right after I got the ice element, the solution became crystal clear. As for Mr. Lugs and Sir Weston, well, that's the candle thing all over again. If I see something that I typically light on fire, I'm going to light it on fire. Third, there's environmental. This is the largest and most varied category. At first glance, it might not even seem fair to put them in one category. By environmental, I'm referring to ghosts that become vulnerable after you move or interact with something in the room that isn't related to an element. The problem with these is that, once again, I didn't need to really think to get to the solution. After tapping and sucking on stuff in the room, I landed on the solution by means of mere coincidence. And it didn't even take me long to do so. You see musical instruments? Just hit them. You see Mr. Lugs eating? Suck up his food. You see an old lady knitting? Yeah, take that, Grandma! Now, on their own, none of these are bad but they never become more complex or difficult to put together. It's always as simple as A leads to B. What about the other ghosts? Well, they involve more of a combat component. All of them have something interesting about them that makes their fight significantly different from other fights in the game. There's Chauncey's, Bogmire's, Bulusus's, and King Boo's unique boss attacks in areas. There's Jarvis's pot mini game, there's Sir Weston's falling icicles and slippery floor, and there's Vincent Van Gore's enemy rush. All these serve to test the player's combat ability, and they do a good enough job of that. Of course, one potential flaw with my logic here is that I'm assuming many of these portrait ghosts are meant to be viewed as puzzles. If I view them simply as further ways of interacting with the mansion, or as a change of pace, or as a way to incorporate different aesthetics or designs into the game, then yeah, they work on those levels. However, I think puzzles are at least one element of many of these encounters, and that element is severely underbaked. In my opinion, focusing more on that one element of the game, focusing on making puzzles that actually feel like puzzles, 
and that are satisfying to solve would have only been a good thing, and I see this as a fairly large missed opportunity. Combat in Luigi's Mansion is unique. You gotta shine the flashlight on ghosts to expose them, then you suck them up with the vacuum. All the while they fight you, flying around, and you gotta tilt the control sticks away from the direction they're running in, moving side to side as you do so. Despite its novelty, Luigi's Mansion's combat is fairly easy to pick up. It took me about 15 minutes or so to get used to it. It's simple, fun, and frenetic. And for better or worse, the combat never gets that difficult. I only had trouble with two ghosts. Sir Weston, because of the slippery floor and icicles making it harder to control Luigi, and Bulusis. Because catching these boos, it's, <laughs> it's a great time. It's so fun. I love this boss. It's just great. Otherwise, it was smooth sailing. However, a game doesn't have to be difficult. Easy is fine. The problem for me is when easiness results in mechanics that feel underexplored. Unfortunately, that's the case here. As far as appearances go, there isn't a problem. There are a wide variety of ghosts for the player to encounter, but that variety doesn't translate to combat. Some of these ghosts grab, some punch, some pop out behind Luigi, some throw things, and some do other stuff. But regardless of the ghost's abilities, the player can handle any encounter the same way. The biggest reason for this is that, despite there being plenty of boys to suck and blow, ghosts are almost always paired with ghosts who are functionally the same or exactly the same. In other words, instead of having interesting groups of ghosts that require different strategies to deal with, it's far more likely that there will just be a big gang of grabbing ghosts or punching ghosts. Of course, there are times when the game throws more interesting combos the player's way, and some ghost types on their own are a bit more interesting to deal with, even when they aren't paired with other ghost types. In particular, the garbage can ghosts stand out. Since they toss around bananas, the player can either choose to suck up the bananas, which can trip Luigi if they're left there, or go straight for the ghosts. It's small, but a choice is presented, an opportunity to strategize. I wish there were more ghosts like these ones, or more ghosts that had unique attributes to them, like the mirror ghost who the player can only see, well, in the mirror. But we haven't discussed one major type of ghost yet, have we? Yeah, that's right. These stupid booches. The first few of them are fine. I mean, they run away, but whatever, it's no big deal. They have pretty low levels of HP and you can suck them up fast. But later? Later these boys are rocking 200 or 300 HP. And if they run into a room you haven't unlocked yet, too bad for you. Guess you gotta come back here and deal with it later. And it's not like they have any interesting attack patterns, they just run. If there were maybe 10 or so of these encounters in the entire game, it would be a lot more forgivable, and serve as an occasional change in pace. As it stands, most of these boos should have either been cut out or made more unique. If each of them had different attack patterns or different criteria for capturing them, then that would at least be something. Instead, these ghosts amount to repeating the same monotonous process at least 25 times. The tedium of capturing them combined with their pun names turns them into a never-ending dad joke. The fact that they're a requirement makes it so much worse too. Because up until you reach Bulisus, maybe you thought you could just ignore them, that this was just some optional side quest type thing. But no, you need to catch a certain number before you can fight that boss. And then you need to catch more before you can fight the final boss. So if you haven't been catching them progressively, get ready for one hell of a slog. Basically, they amount to an unnecessary, mind-numbing roadblock. And guess what? I spent 37 minutes catching these guys. Of course, I'm sure I could have done a better job catching them, which would have brought this time down. But I'm also sure I could have done a worse job. I can only speak from my own personal experience, and in this case, that experience was no good. I mean, I could have watched nearly half of Kung Fu Panda in the time it took me to catch some booze. And the game itself only took me 5 hours and 45 minutes to complete. So yeah, a pretty hefty amount of my time with this game was spent with booze. And it would have only been better if they weren't there. Despite all these complaints though, I still think combat is a net positive experience. Sure, I wish it was fleshed out a bit more, but I can't ignore the fact that sometimes I want to go suck up some ghosts. I even kind of want to go back and get the better silver and gold portraits I missed because I didn't do good enough. Additionally, despite the combat's novelty, I never have to think about what I'm doing. It comes automatically, like the controller is an extension of my thoughts, like it's the most natural way to turn those thoughts into actions on the screen. And the importance of that shouldn't be understated regardless of any problems I have with enemy encounter variety or booze. On the surface, exploration in Luigi's Mansion seems great. The game pushes its setting far, creating a variety of unique rooms, each of them with their own personality and feel. We've got a music room, an art studio, a kid's bedroom, some sort of toy room, a courtyard, and so on. Entering each room is a visually and tonally pleasant experience. 
and as the ghosts are cleared out and the lights turn on, the rooms come to life, the detailed and focused art direction becoming clearer than ever. Even so, certain elements of the game hold the exploration back. First and foremost, the game is too railroaded. See, when the player gets a key in Luigi's Mansion, that key only works on one door. This means that, for the vast majority of the game, players will be running from room to predetermined room. So even though the mansion appears fairly open, it isn't. Each of these rooms is essentially a small level, and one that must be completed before moving on to the next level. While this more linear structure provides a chance to slowly introduce players to more challenging puzzles and combat encounters, easy puzzles in combat render this almost entirely useless. I think it would have been much better if any key could open any door, or at least the vast majority of them. While this might have required some slight tweaking of how the game handles enemy encounters, being able to choose what order you do things in would have greatly bolstered the game's replay value and sense of exploration. After all, the setting is creepy. There's mystery to it, a sense of the unknown. I would much rather explore that unknown in whatever order I see fit, instead of being pushed to do this thing, then this thing, then this thing. The way exploration unfolds here is far too repetitious. Enter room, fight enemies, get key, go to the next room. That's how most of this plays out. This feeds into another issue. Most of the game is too predictable. Whenever I entered a new room, I knew there was going to be some fight with ghosts, and I knew that fight would be over the moment the lights turned on. After those lights are on, they aren't turning off. Except for one moment in the game when they do, of course. Basically, once I'd cleared out a room, I knew I was safe there, and I knew exactly when I'd finished off the enemies there. While this might not seem like a bad thing, it made me feel a bit too safe and certain of what was happening. It sucked so much of the mystery out of this otherwise mysterious game world. Then there's the fact that beyond this, the player will likely need to do a lot of backtracking. The player will get led around from floor to floor, you need to go through areas they've already seen, areas that won't change much, if at all. The worst moment of this comes with Uncle Grimly, when the power to the mansion gets cut. Here, the player gets a hint as to where he is. Mirrors. That's it. The player's gotta go looking from room to room. Even if the player somehow remembers each room that has mirrors, they've still got a healthy number of rooms to look through. Hell, even cheaters like me who look it up have to go from the top of the mansion all the way back to the start. Of course, if the players happen to take a picture of a mirror, they'll know a mirror will take them back to the foyer. Even then though, it's going to take some time. Another thing, whenever you turn off the game, you start off back at the foyer. So let's say you save the game on the third floor and you gotta go make dinner like a peasant and you turn off the console. Well, now you gotta wander all the way back up there. I'm not sure what the rationale was for doing this, but it would have been much better for players to just start off back in the room they had saved in. Because I turned off the game many times throughout my playthrough, and by the fifth time I was wandering back to where I'd been, I was peeved. The punishment for dying is the same too. You'll go back to the foyer. At the end of the game, the player will receive a house or mansion of their own, based on how much money they collected throughout the adventure. Money is also related to how well they did in enemy encounters. If players do well enough in portrait ghost encounters, they will also receive either a bronze, silver, or gold frame. So yeah, the game provides incentives to replay. But because I don't find traversing this mansion that fun, none of these incentives were enough to make me want to play it again. All the pieces are there. Great environments, a rich atmosphere, varied enemy designs, including loads of portrait ghosts. But all these problems I've discussed undermine that potential greatness. All in all, I may want to revisit Luigi's Mansion to experience its setting again, but oddly enough, I don't really want to explore it. These mixed, almost contradictory feelings define my opinion of the game. On one hand, its atmosphere is amazing, its setting is so well realized, and the core of its combat is just unique and frenetic, and I love it. On the other hand, there's the overly repetitious nature of exploration, combat, and puzzles. In the end, I guess Luigi's Mansion is a game I'm glad I played, but one that feels like it could have been so much better. There are all these things that keep me from coming back, but at its core, there's something that keeps me wanting to come back.